Chapter 2. The Carpet Bag I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it under my arm, and started out for Cape Horn in the Pacific. Quitting the good city of old Manhattan, I duly arrived in New Bedford. It was on a Saturday night in December. Much was I disappointed upon learning that the little packet for Nantucket had already sailed, and that in no way of reaching that place would offer till the following Monday. As most young candidates for the pains and penalties of whaling stop at the same New Bedford, thence to embark on their voyage, it may as well be related that I, for one, had no idea of so doing. For my mind was made up to sail in none other than a Nantucket craft, because there was a fine, boisterous something about everything connected with that famous old island, which amazingly pleased me. Besides, though, New Bedford has of late been gradually monopolizing the business of whaling. And though in this matter poor old Nantucket is now much behind her, yet Nantucket with her great original, the Tire of Carthage, the place where the first dead American whale was stranded. Where else but from Nantucket did those aboriginal whalemen, the Redmen, first sally out in canoes to give chase to the Leviathan? And where but from Nantucket, too, did the first adventurous little sloop put forth, partly laden with imported cobblestones, so goes the story, to throw with the whales in order to discover when they were nigh enough to at risk a harpoon from the bowsprit. Now having a night today and still another night following before me in New Bedford, ere I could embark for my desired port, it became a matter of concernment where I was to eat and sleep meanwhile. It was a very dubious looking day, a very dark and dismal night, bitingly cold and cheerless. I knew no one in the place. With anxious grapnels I had pounded my pocket and only brought up a few pieces of silver. Wherever you go, Ishmael, said I to myself, as I stood in the middle of a dreary street shouldering my bag and comparing the gloom towards the north with the darkness towards the south. Wherever in your wisdom you may conclude to lodge for the night, my dear Ishmael, be sure to inquire the price, and don't be too particular. With halting steps, I paced the streets and pa passed the sign of the crossed harpoons but it looked too expensive and jolly there. Further on, from the bright red windows of the Swordfish Inn, there came such fervent rays that it seemed to have melted the packed snow and ice from before the house, for everywhere else the congealed frost lay ten inches thick and a hard, asphaltic pavement. Rather weary for me, when I struck my foot against the flinty projections, because from hard, remorseless service the soles of my boots were in a most miserable plight. Too expensive and jolly, again thought I, pausing one moment to watch the broad glare in the street and hear the sounds of tinkling glasses within. But go on, Ishmael, said I at last. Don't you hear? Get away from before the door. Your patch boots are stopping the way. So on I went. I now by instinct follow the streets that took me waterward. For there, doubtless, were the cheapest, if not the cheeriest inns. Such dreary streets. Blocks of blackness, not houses on either hand, and here and there a candle, like a candle moving about in a tomb. At this hour of the night, the last day of the week, the quarter of the town proved all but deserted. But presently I came to a smoky light proceeded from a low, wide building, the door of which stood invitingly open. It had a careless look, as if it were meant for the use of the public. So entering, the first thing I did was to stumble over an ash box in the porch. <laughs> ha, thought I, ha, as the flying particles almost choked me. Are these the ashes from that destroyed city, Gomorrah? But the cross harpoons and the swordfish? This, then, must be the sign of the trap. However, I picked myself up, and hearing a loud voice within, pushed on and opened a second interior door. It seemed like the great black parliament sitting in Tophet. A hundred black faces turned around in their rows to peer, and beyond, a black angel of doom was bearing a look in a, a book in a pulpit. It was a black church, and the preacher's text was about the blackness of darkness, and the weeping and wailing and gnashing, teeth gnashing there. Ah, 
Ishmael, muttered I, backing out. Wretched entertainment at the sign of the trap. Moving on, I at last came to a dim sort of light, not far from the docks, and heard of a forlorn creaking in the air, and looking up saw a swinging sign over a door, with a white painting upon it, faintly representing tall straight jet of misty spray, and these words underneath, the spouter in, Peter Coffin. Coffin? Spouter? Rather ominous in that particular connection, thought I. But it is a common name in Nantucket, they say, and I suppose this Peter here is an immigrant from there. As the light looked so dim, and the place for the time looked quiet enough, and the dilapidated little wooden house itself looked as if it might have been carted here from the ruins of some burnt district, and as a swinging sign had a poverty-stricken sort of creak to it, I thought that here was the very spot for cheap log lodgings, and the best of pea coffee. It was a queer sort of place. A gable-ended old house, one side palsied as a word, and leaning over sadly. It stood on a sharp, bleak corner, where that tempestuous wind, Euclidean, kept up a worse howling than ever it did about poor Paul's tossed craft. Your Clayton, nevertheless, is a mighty pleasant zephyr to any one indoors, with his feet on the hog quietly toasting for bed. And judging of that impetuous wind called Your Clayton, Your Clayton, says an old writer, of whose works I possess the only copy extent, it marketh a marvelous difference. Whether thou lookest out in front of a glass window where all the frost is on the outside, or whether thou observest it from the sashless window where the frost is on both sides and of which the white death is the only glazier true enough thought i as this passage occurred to my mind old black letter thou reasonest well yes these eyes are windows and this body is mine of mine is the house what a pity they didn't stop up the chinks and crannies though and thrust a little lint here or there but it's too late to make any improvements now. The universe is finished, the copestone is on, and the chips were carted off a million years ago. Poor Lazarus there, chattering his teeth against the curbstone for his pillow, and shaking off his tatters with his shiverings. He might plug up both ears with rags and put a corn cob into his mouth, and yet that would not keep out the tempestuous Eurycleidon. Eurycleidon, says old Dives in his red silken wrapper, for he, he had a redder one afterwards. Poo poo. What a fine frosty night. How Orion glimmers with northern lights. Let them talk of their oriental summer climes of everlasting conservatories. Give me the privilege of making my own summer with my own coals. But what thinks Lazarus? Can he warm his blue hands by holding them to the grand northern lights? Would not Lazarus rather be in Sumatra than here? Would he not far rather lay down his lengthwise against the line of the equator? Ye, ye gods, go down to the fiery pit itself in order to keep out this frost. Now that Lazarus should lie st stranded there on the curved stone before the door of dives, this is more wonderful than that an iceberg should be moored to one of the Malaccas. Yet dives himself... He too lives like a czar in an ice palace made of frozen size, and being a president of a temperance society, he only drinks the tepid tears of orphans. But no more of this blubbering now. We are going a-wailing, and there is plenty of that yet to come. Let us scrape the ice from our frosted feet and see what sort of place this spatter may be. That is the end of chapter 2.